Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started again. Um, hopefully, people are sufficiently caffeinated. Um, I have been attempting to caffeinate. Um, so let's let's get a little bit more a little bit more involved um, in the, in this half. So um, let's start doing some shallow NLP, um, and then we'll do a little bit more sophisticated NLP. Um, and I'll show how uh, we can use the output of, of some of these NLP techniques to generate features that we can use for document representations. Um, so let's start off with um, the sort of the, the sort of the initial uh, NLP step that most people will do on on sentences, and that is to extract part of speech tags. Um, once you have sentences that are part of a speech tag, you can then tag or you can then parse the part of speech tagged sentences because you now have the leaf nodes of your tree and then you build up from there. Um, so let's start, let's start there. Um, so all of the, 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 and this is sort of a, a, a separate part of the library. We're going to go off into a separate part of the library for a little bit and then come back to, to indexing um, in a bit. Um, this is all part of the sequences library uh, of Meta. We have a, a couple different models for doing sequence labeling tasks. Um, the one I recommend you use, unless you have a particularly good reason not to, is uh, the greedy perceptron, um, because it's it's fast and uh, easy to train, easy to evaluate, um, and does pretty good most of the time. And then if you really need it, you can pull out the heavy machinery that is the linear chain CRF to do a little bit more um, if you need to. But the perceptron works pretty well um, for a you know a small fraction of the cost of a CRF. Um, okay, so let's start with a sequence. Um, so the sequence is, is going to be represented as um, sort of basically um, tuples, right? You've got um, the word and its associated label. Um, so I can build a sequence here. And I can just add the individual symbols. So the, the, the words are called symbols, and the, the labels are labels. Um, so here, uh, I don't yet know what the labels for my sequence are. I've just constructed this particular sequence. Um, and so then the, the sequence labeling prediction task is going to be to figure out, OK, what are those labels supposed to be? Um, and in the case of part of speech tagging, those labels are supposed to be the associated part of speech for every word. But you may have, there's lots of different applications that all fall into this kind of model, right? You can do. Um, you know, chunking. You're gonna do do. Uh, you know, figure out. You know, what what blocks are all about the same entity, right? You can so you can figure out. You know, the the there the labels become. Is this the beginning of an entity, inside of an entity, and the en end of an entity, right? But they they all kind of fall under the sequence labeling task. So there's lots of things that you can do with this. I'm just gonna show you one particular thing, which is easy to explain and easy to understand, and I have a pre-trained model for. Most importantly, um, okay. So let's do let's do part of speech tagging. Um, I'm going to quickly quickly grab a model, and we're going to see if we completely break the Wi-Fi. Um, so as everybody hammers it all at once, actually, I'm going to do what everyone else is going to do, and that's going to be to go here and search for um, tagger and just copy-paste these lines because that's faster. So if you go to, the, go to the notebook and you just search for tagger, we're going to grab these two model files. Resolving. Oh, 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 OK. All right. So that'll take a little bit to, to, to download and, and, and decompress. Um, but this is, this is a pre-trained um, part of speech tagger using Greedy Perceptron for um, identifying uh, English part of speech. Um, so I don't have models for other languages yet, but I really, really want to do that. So if you are interested in doing sort of these uh, sequence labeling tasks for other languages, please talk to me, because I would love to have a pre-trained part of speech tagger for Chinese, a pre-trained part of speech tagger for French, a pre-trained part of speech tagger for uh, German, et cetera. OK. So now um, we're going to go ahead and load this file in. I'm just going to. Copy paste that here. We're going to give it the um, path to the folder that we extracted the features in. If you're on Windows, again, wget's not going to work. Tar is also not going to work. So go to the URL, grab the file, um, save that somewhere. Um, you can use whatever your favorite extraction software is. Mine is 7-Zip. 
um, to extract just the first layer. So you're going to extract the folder, but leave the, so, so you can see my, my uh, tree here. I'm leaving feature mapping and tagger model gzipped. Leave them gzipped. Just extract the folder. Everybody else just use tar. And it'll take a little bit to uh, load in the model. <coughs> that shouldn't be taking that long. Oh no. My first bug. <coughs> Interesting. Okay. Bug. I will fix it. Sorry about that. Thank you for. Yeah, we did get Windows. Do import and then come back here. Okay. Yeah. Not sure why you would do that. Okay. All right. Um, sorry about that. Okay, now we've loaded in our model. Um, I want to go grab my document and document. Just let me build my state back up over here a bit. Okay, great. All right, so now I've got I've got my I've got my sequence. I've got my tagging model, um, so I can take my tagging model and apply it to the sequence. And we fill in the um, part of speech for each of the words here. Um, so this is this is on a specific. I mean, I, I pre-constructed a sequence. So if you have your training data or you ha you have the data that you want to evaluate this on from somewhere else, that's great. In general, you probably are doing this to do some sort of feature extraction, which means you're doing it on documents coming out of a corpus from somewhere. So given that we have. this document, um, I want to ex first extract the sequences that are in this document and then tag the, each of those individual sequences. Um, for time, I was going to have leave that as an, as an exercise. Um, for time, I'm just going to grab the code from here. This essentially is going to use the ICU tokenizer to figure out where the sentence boundaries are and then creates an, a list of sequences based on splitting on those, those um, part of speech tag boundaries. So now, um, here um, it's important that we use the same filter chain that the model was trained on because you want what it's seeing in the words to be the same kinds of things it was seeing when it was training. Um, so in this case, I'm only using the ICU tokenizer with sentence boundary tags and a normalizer called the pen tree bank normalizer that tries to make the, the data that's coming into the um, tagging model look like the data that was, it was trained on, and this model happens to be trained on the pen tree bank. Um, so if I do that, I should be able to get an array of sequences and then And here we've got two different, it's sort of hard to tell because I didn't delimit them by anything, but we've, we've successfully tagged the two different sentences in our example document. All right, so now we've got part of speech tagged um, word sequences. At this point, um, we can do sort of the same kind, any of the same kind of analyses that we were doing on when we had streams of individual tokens. We just have streams of tagged tokens at this point. So now we can extract things like n-grams of part of speech tags or n-grams of part of speech tagged words, um, all just from using that same 
same analysis kind of pipeline. Um, so um, I'm going to go to the next level of abstraction at this point, though, and say, well, you know, the, the part of, I, figuring out the part of speech of the sentences is great, but I want to know how these sentences are constructed. Um, and that can be useful for a lot of different things. Um, uh, the, the most salient example for us, because it's one of the competitions, should we have time to get to it, um, and that is uh, uh, native language identification. So, if you, so that task is figuring out for, for an article written in a particular language, say English, um, can you identify what the nationality of the original author what is? So if it's someone whose native, lang native language is not English, can you detect it? Um, not just that it's not, the, not their native language, but what is their native language just from the, Engli from the English that's presented in the document. And one way of doing that involves maybe looking at features of how they construct their sentences because people from different backgrounds will tend to construct their sentences di in different ways. Um, so let's, let's, try and, let's try and get some um, more hierarchical analysis going on now. So I'm going to quickly grab, oops, I scrolled past it. So if you control F on that page, look for um, constituency and you should find, find this. I'm gonna grab a, another model which is a parser model. It's a little bit bigger, so this might take a little bit longer to, to do. Um, but this, this model it has, has been trained on the same, same kind of data as the tagging model was, um, the pen tree bank. And the pen tree bank was basically constructed um, by a bunch of linguists spending lots and lots of time getting analysis of a uh, collection of English sentences completely right, or at least as right as they can get it. Um, so this was used as training data for this. So we're going to use the same um, sort of pre-processing pipeline to feed into the parser. Namely, we're going to use the ICU tokenizer with sentence boundary tags. We'll then use the Pentry Bank normalizer to do things like what I talked about cannot, how that needs to be normalized to look like Pentry Bank. Um, we'll use a tagging model, in this case the greedy perceptron tagging model, to get tag sequences. Then from those tag sequences we apply the, um, part of the, the constituency parser on top of that. Um, this particular constituency parser is um, probably among some of the faster ones that you can find. Um, there's a trade-off between speed and accuracy. Um, so there's another model um, that I won't download here because it, it is bigger. Um, that uses beam search and it improves the, the labeled F1 of the parser by something like four points or so. Um, so if you, if you really, really, really need the accuracy, you can use a more complicated model. Um, I'm just going to use the simplest model here, which does pretty well most of the time. Um, can you tell I'm stalling for time? <laughs> so the goal, the goal, right, is once, once we have this parser, we're going to be able to get, can, um, oh yeah, question, yeah. Yeah, so the, I, I'm not sure what's I'm not sure what's happening there. I'll have to look at it after. Are you um, using Windows? If you if you restart the kernel, so are you yeah. using Jupyter? Yeah. If you restart the kernel and try it again, it should work. I'm not sure what's going on there. Yeah, I'll have yeah. to I'll have to look into it. Yeah, it worked. It, I had the same I had the same issue, and it, it, it that that fix worked for me. I'm not sure what's going on there. It shouldn't. So if it, if it's taking if it's taking longer than a couple seconds, something is wrong. So try try restarting the kernel. That happened to me. I'm not sure what's going on. I'll have to I'll have to look. Um, I may have introduced a bug last night. Um, okay. So I have the, I have the parser now. So let's uh, let's load up that parser, which hopefully won't have the same issue. This does take a little bit longer, but it shouldn't take so long. Come on. Okay, great. No crash, good. All right, so now we got the parser, so now we can do something like, um, oh, what did I call it? Pretty, oh, pretty string. I need to fix that. Okay. Um, you can grab, just grab that from the notebook. I'm going to try and speed along here a little bit. But now we've got the actual parse tree 
for the individual sentences. And now the, the, our sentence has been decomposed into the, in the individual constituent phrases, each of which is hierarchically decomposed in those, into those constituent phrases until you reach the leaf nodes, which are those part of speech tagged words that we have to begin with. So now that we have the tree representations for the sentences in our document, we can start to ask, we can start to generate features that talk about how sentences are being constructed, like, um, you know, what, what kind of productions in this tree did, they, did, the, did the user happen to use? Do they use a lot of productions that look like NP goes to XY, where people from a different background tend to use NP goes to YZ, right? Different kinds of productions in, in this tree. Um, so let's grab, I'm trying to summarize a lot of things here. So I'm going to fire up a new analyzer that uses the same models that we were just that I was just demonstrating here um, to produce uh, to produce tree representations for the um, sentences. And there's a number of different kinds of of parse tree features that we could extract. Um, I'm just going to use the the notebook example here just for for speed's sake. Um, so you can extract things like, you know, what's the, what's the depth of each of the trees? You can count how many times that you see a tree of a certain depth. You can do things like looking at, um, this is the one I was just talking about where you're looking at the, the productions that are used. So this is telling you, you know, how, how many times did they use the production PP goes to IN NP? Um, or, you know, productions that are, that are slightly more complicated. You can also look at just the structure. So you can get like a lisp looking representation of your sentence that's just what it, like how how is it was it heavy on the left heavy on the right what did that kind of that that structure look like how does it, and and how is that hierarchically decomposed um, you can also do uh, different kinds of features here where you don't omit all of the labels maybe you keep the root node but then omit everything underneath that there's lots of different features that you can extract here all of which are available there um, So okay, so I want to I, I will I will spend a little bit of time on this. So um, while you can construct the analyzer pipelines manually um, through code like we have been doing, there's also a uh, configuration format where you can sort of declar declaratively state this is what my analysis pipeline should should be. Um, and these are these are uh, written in uh, Toml files. Um, if you don't know what Toml is, it's basically a glorified INI style format. So it should be fairly fairly easy to read, hopefully. Um, so I'm going for anyway. Um, so this particular configuration file um, says that I'm going to combine the output of two different analyzers. So here's where the configuration starts to be really really useful: is when you're combining different kinds of representations. Like I want to use, you know, bigram words and also some structural parse tree features, right? I don't want to just use structural parse tree features. I don't want to just use words. I want to combine the two different orthogonal representations of my document into one representation, or in, into one document feature vector that I can then use for doing classification, for example. So th in this particular configuration file, we've got um, unigram words, um, bigram part of speech tags, and uh, subtree tree features. Um, and so each, each of these sort of blocks represents one particular analyzer. So this particular block says, please extract unigram words using the default unigram chain, which is uh, just a, a sensible default for English. So that is combining things like lower casing, quarter two stemming, length filtering, et cetera. Um, this one is construct engrams, but of part of speech tags using, this, uh, using a CRF model. Um, to do the tokenization, just do ICU followed by pen tree bank. Um, and then construct bigrams, right? And this one again is doing tree features, right? You're using this particular tagger, this particular parser. This is the way that we want to do the word segmentation beforehand. Um, and this array would give you a list of different kinds of tree features. So this might be subtree, semi-skeleton, skeleton, skeleton um, et cetera, depth, whatever. Once you have a configuration file like this, so I'm just going to go ahead and grab this entire block of code, run it over here. <coughs> Once we have that, we can just load it directly from the configuration file in one line of code. Uh, I didn't have the CRF model. Uh, I need to download that, okay.
So I'm rushing a little bit because I want to get you to the competition because I think that'll be a lot of fun. Um, so the CRF is just, it's just a different part of speech tagging model. It's slightly more accurate. Um, okay, so now I should be able to do this again. And now if I analyze a particular document, I get out a representation that looks like this. So you can see mixed in here are going to be bigrams of part of speech tags, subtree features about the actual syntactic parse trees that were constructed from each sentence, um, and a couple unigram words that, that are sort of, uh, a lot of them are missing because we did the default chain, which is removing stop words and things that are very, very short and that sort of thing. But there are unigram words in here as well. So you, can, so you can combine all these different analyzers in whatever way you'd like to produce a bigger feature representation that covers different aspects of the document. And which ones should you use? Well, that really depends on what your task is, right? So when you're doing things that the, the way they construct their sentences doesn't really matter, maybe you don't care about doing parse tree features, but you're doing things like authorship at attribution. I'm trying to figure out which, which person wrote this, this uh, article. I, I have a, a, you know, if I want to be nefarious and figure out who wrote the article that I'm uh, peer reviewing, don't do that. Um, you could do something like this and analyze the way they construct their sentences and know that mm, this article might have been from Cheng, for example, um, or from me. It's overly verbose. Okay. Um, hmm. What else have we done? Tree analyzers. Okay. Let's, so let's, let's get to information retrieval so I can get you onto the competition. Um, gonna download another, another data set. Um, ac so so at, at this point, um, you should make sure you download this so that, because that, that'll be your local testing data set for, for the competition to play locally with your parameters before you submit to run on the real data. Um, we're going to grab this particular data set. This is a um, publicly available information retrieval data set. It's a very, very small toy data set, um, but it's, it's nice here because it has relevance judgments. Um, so there's a set of queries and a set of relevance judgments for those queries that say whether, the, whether document I is relevant to query J. Um, so now that we have that data set, I'm going to quickly create a configuration file for it. Um, what this is doing is basically saying, please make sure to actually preserve the full text of the document so I can look at it later when I'm getting my search results, because sometimes you don't care about that, um, and that the format of it is in Meta's line corpus format. Um, going to just, oops, oh my, scrolling under control. I'm going to grab this, essentially this configuration file from over there. And write it. This is basically just saying um, the data, this is where the data set is located. It's in my current working directory because that's where I extracted it. Um, what is the data set name? Cranfield, that's the folder that it's in. Um, what is the corpus configuration file to load? Because d depending on, you may have within one data set several subcorpora. So this is telling you um, which type of corpus you're looking at and where to find it. Um, where to store the index, we're going to get to creating an inverted index here in just a second, so that'll be stored in this particular folder. The path of the query relevance um, and stop words in just a simple, we're just going to use bag of words simple um, default unigram chain here. So now that we've got, now that we've got the, don't think I, oops, hi, okay, don't think I've done that. Okay, so now we've got, we, we have a configuration file, um, so now we can just use the configuration file to build an index. So here we're gonna, since, since we want, we're interested in doing information retrieval, we're gonna build an inverted index which allows us to map a term ID or a feature ID to um, the list of documents that it contains and how many times those documents contain that term. It also collects some relevant statistics about the terms that you can do things like TF-IDF weighting and that sort of thing. Um, so we can create an inverted index What did I, I call it? Cranfield config. Um, by simply calling make inverted index and passing it a uh, path to a configuration file. Um, 
I should probably change the name of this function. So what this will do is if, the, if it detects that the index exists already, it will just load it. If the index does not exist or is, or is detected as being corrupted, like missing files or something, it'll, create, it'll recreate it. So in this case, I don't, I don't yet have a Cranfield index, so it'll create it the first time. But if I call this again later, it'll just load it up. And since I set CR logging, you can see sort of progress output. This data set is so small that it just indexes immediately. Um, but if you're indexing like Wikipedia, this will take some time and so you can get some progress output. Um, and also some diagnostics. Like there's some documents that end up being empty after we remove all the stop words and other things. They just don't contain a lot of uh, interesting content. Um, which could be a problem because that means that I can't ever retrieve document 470. So it gives you some sort of diagnostic criteria while you're doing the indexing um, as needed. Okay, but now that I have this inverted index, I can ask a lot of questions about it. Um, so I can, I can query, you know, the average document length. So I can get things like, you know, how, how on average, how many terms were, how many actual index terms were there in each document. Um, I can get the um, number of, the number of documents that contained a particular term. Uh, I can get the, the total number of occurrences for a particular term in the, in the index and so on. Number of different things I can do here. Um, here are some examples, right? Number of documents, unique terms, average document length, number of corpus terms. Um, but let's go to let's get to let's get to the nitty gritty. Let's actually let's actually retrieve some documents. So I can construct a ranker here. Um, the ranker is uh, a um, scoring function that scores all the documents in the index relative to a particular query. Um, and this I'm just using Okapi BM25 because it turns out to be one of the best retrieval functions still. Um, and then I can apply um, I can apply the ranker to eventually the inverted index, my query, and I can specify you know please give me the top k results. Um, so let's create a let's create a query in the in the form of a document. We're going to look for flow equilibrium documents that contain the words flow and equilibrium. Um, and then I can just do um, ranker.score, right? Yes. Let's get the top five results for our query. So um, it gives you the, the result. It gives you is a list of tu of tuples. The first index, the first part of the tuple is the document ID, and the second part is the actual score that that document got. Um, so to just get some idea of whether what it's done is at all reasonable, um, let's actually just grab like the first 250 characters of each document um, that's in this list so we can see if I called it something different. Scores. Great. So we search for flow equilibrium and we can see, okay, this at least mentions equilibrium and gas flow, airflow properties, equilibrium flow. Seems, seems like it's working, right? Um, so you can use this now to sort of figure out, you know, if, if, if you want to do further analysis, if you have a lot of data, you can index a large data set pretty, pretty efficiently with this. The indexing process is going to be multi-threaded, so if you have, it scales roughly linearly. There's a little bit of lock contention if you get above, you know, like 24 threads, um, but on, on reasonable size hardware, um, it scales pretty nicely. Um, so you can index quite a lot of data, but then oftentimes you want to do sort of more sophisticated analysis of smaller subsets of that data. So you can use the search engine to figure out, okay, these are the documents I care about. Now extract these documents, now do topic modeling, or now do clustering, or now do classification. I don't care about classifying things that, you know, are, are just, you know, noise documents. I only want to classify things that I know are about a particular event, for example, right? So I might, you know, create a query that's about that particular event to extract the subset of my corpus that's relevant, and then do classification about whether the sentiment about that event was positive or negative or something. Um, okay. Um, so I, I also mentioned um, you know, we're a full-fledged IR toolkit. So we have the ability to do IR evaluations. So if you have like a track data set and you've got uh, queries and relevance judgments, or you've created one yourself, uh, or you have pseudo relevance judgments and you want to do something like this, um, you can do an actual evaluation. So um, in this particular case, this is a, um, it's like, I think it's, I think this data, this data set's pretty old. I think it's pre-track, but th we've, pro we've processed it into the correct format um, for, um, for doing information retrieval experiments. Track is just a, it was a, um, the sort of one of the um, 
big movements in the information retrieval community to create sort of standardized data sets and standardized evaluations for information retrieval algorithms. Um, so let's do an IR experiment. Um, this particular data set has relevance judgments and, and uh, queries, so we can do um, an evaluation. So here, what, what I'm doing here is I'm going to say, okay, when I'm, when I'm running, I'm just going to look at the top 10 results and see what my evaluation metrics look like for the top 10 results because people don't ever look beyond the first page, so this is maybe reasonable. Um, I'm going to loop through my query file for every query number and line in that file. I'm going to create a, create a query to actually hit the index with. I'm going to rank it with my ranking function. And then I'm going to, I'm, then I'm going to you know, compute some particular evaluation metric. Here I'm using average precision, but we have NDCG and a number of different other metrics. So if I do that, I can see for each query what my average precision is. Um, and then I can also compute my mean average precision, which is the average of, all, of the average precision over all of the um, individual queries. So you can, you can use this as a way of evaluating different ranking functions for tuning parameters. If you have a validation set, right, you can do, do your own in-house evaluations to see, okay, what parameters roughly make sense for my kind of data, and then use that to actually improve the, the search uh, experience for people. Okay. Um, uh, yes. So where are you specifying the editorial judgment of the ground truths rather than the precision? Do you have like a ground truth? Yeah, and for this data set, there, there was uh, people who constructed a ground truth. But I don't see that in, in your building. Um, it was, it was um, in, as part of the corpus, it was in that, in that file we downloaded. Um, it's in the configuration here. So there's a file in that Cranfield folder that's got the, got the query relevance files. Yeah. And there's also the, the list of queries is also in that corpus as well. Yeah? If you do not have the queries, can we sample some document from a data set and treat the document as a query? So sometimes to evaluate our, our retrieval model of some data set, we can, you know, from, for example, from 20 mil group data sets, we can sample one document. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they would do one query, yeah. One sample document. So can we do this in an automated way, or? It, um, it's fa fairly easy, <coughs> right? You you can you can grab the f if if you stored the full text for your documents, it's pretty easy to grab the full text for any document in the index. Um, so you could iterate over all your documents, grab the full text, create it, create a query, um, do a top one ranking to make sure that it's you get the same document back out. Um, I think is what you're saying. Um, to make sure that it actually is retrieving things that are relevant to that, or. I guess you can use the uh, all the documents in that same category as yeah. approximation of relevant documents that you hope to retrieve by using one of them. If that's what you want, you need to create a relevance judgment file that uh, we already had here. But you can easily do that. Just pre-process the data to prepare a set of queries, which are documents in this case, or, or some sample of the documents, and also the set of relevance judgments for each query. Yeah, and if and if you if you have a if you have a corpus that has labels, um, the labels will be stored in the index. Um, so you can probably programmatically, within Python, actually create your relevance judgment file pretty easily, um, by just saying every every document that's in the same category is relevant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, um, where was I? Right. Um, so the last thing before I want to get you guys started on how much time have we got? Excellent. Great. Um, before I get you started on doing an actual competition, um, you can define your own ranking function in Python. Um, it's, again, again, the, the caveat being it's obviously not going to be as fast as the pre-compiled ranking functions that are part of the toolkit. But if you want to experiment with a completely different ranking function, it's often easier to just kind of fiddle around in the Python terminal and figure out you know, whether your model is working or not. And then once you have something that you suspect is good, go ahead and write it in C++ to make it fast. Um, so how do, you, how do we create a ranker? Um, you basically fill in this skeleton. In the competition code, there will be this skeleton, so you don't have to worry about it too much. But basically, you define init, make sure that you do this because that's how the binding works um, to make sure it initializes base classes, take some parameters in. And then you, you define score one, which is the, um, the contribution to the score for one matched query term for this particular ranking function. Um, if you need something that 
is doing the entire document at once. I think you can define score and just override the entire query ranking strategy. But most ranking functions can be decomposed as a sum of score one for each match query term, right? So here you can just define what is the, what's the inner part of the summation, basically, of your ranking function. Um, this, uh, this ranker is obviously not a reasonable ranker. This is just showing you how you could do it. Um, part of the competition will be seeing if you can come up with a ranker that's better than any, any of the built-in ones. Or if you can tune a ranker to be better than other people's. So who's ready? Yeah. Learning to rank kind of a model, you would yeah. Yeah, and you can, you could, you know, you, in, we have, you know, um, stochastic gradient descent, SVM kind of things. So you could, you, you could actually use the classifiers that are built into meta to do learning the, learning of the ranking function and then just plug it in through here. Yeah. Learning to rank is on my list of things to actually add as a built in ranker. Right now we don't have one, um, but we have a number of different, um, sort of just more standard relevance, uh, algorithms for like, um, Jelenic Mercer, Deerslay Pryor, we can actually get a, get a list, I think, from, uh, oops. I don't know if, does that give me subclasses? No, it doesn't, okay. There's a number of, there's a whole bunch of different ranking functions, including things that do, do relevance, uh, pseudo-relevance feedback, so K, um, KL Divergence and uh, Rockio are also on there. Um, okay, who's ready to uh, do a little Kaggle? We'll see if, see if you completely break all of my infrastructure. It'll be great. Um, okay, so um, here's what we're gonna do. Uh, this is gonna take a little bit to get everybody set up, but once we're set up, it should, it, it should um, be, be, be pretty nice. So we're gonna use a, a, a sort of virtual lab kind of environment. So I have, a, I have a system set up that basically whenever you commit to a particular repository in my system, it'll automatically run a build job and do, do computation of the uh, results for your particular method and then submit them to a leaderboard server to do, to, to do the judgment. It's basically gonna automa automatically do the Kaggle competition without you having to download the data sets because that can sort of be uh, time consuming and also there's licenses and stuff involved. If I do it this way, data sets don't leave my servers. Um, so if everybody could go to gitlab.textdata.org, um, I'm going to sign out. Um, I believe registration should work. <laughs> so go ahead and sign up for an account. Um, when you do, um, there should be a, uh, KDD 2017 group, user group that's a, that, that is available. Um, I need you to request access to it, and then I can add you to that, and then you should have access to the repositories. Um, you can also, I think, uh, sign in with, if, with uh, Google, this does work. Um, so if, you, if you're already logged into your Google account, just hit that button and it will instantly be done. So I recommend doing that. Um, and then if you go to groups, um, Public groups, there should be KDD 2017, uh, and there should be a way to request access. I think there should be a button if you're not a member of the group. Um, but basically, I'm gonna, try and get every, I'm gonna try and get it to the point where everybody has their own repository that's a fork of the skeleton code, and then we can sort of play around with uh, that skeleton and you can commit and, and see your results updating in real time. So there should be, how do I get to... Does it, does it not? The, the element is a try, it's, it's try data. Hmm, okay. 
sign up doesn't work, but I tried logging with Google account and that does work. Even I tried okay. Google account. Hmm. Google doesn't work. Refresh. Refresh. It was like five tries for me. I can't okay. find the KDB group though. You can't find it? If you go to groups, it doesn't doesn't list it? Oh, groups. I'm going to search. I think I'm using the new interface, maybe. Um. Yes. Okay, you found it? Use the old navigation. Search that's what everybody Okay, so assuming eventually you, you can get in, I'm I'm not sure why it's why it is being fiddly with registration. Just try a couple times and it should work. Um, if you click the little uh, hamburger icon, you should be able to go to groups, um, public groups. And if you go here, I'm already a member, so it doesn't show me the option. But if you go to that group, you should see a button like that to request access. Um, once you do that, I can add you to the group. Um, once I figure out where those are listed. Um, okay, great, awesome. So there, are, there, so there are a number of people who are who have figured it out. Great. Um, yes. Yes. And now I click, now I get to click yes a whole bunch of times. Once you're in the group, um, there is uh, there are two repositories. We're going to do the search competition first. So look for in in KDD 2017. There should be search dash competition. Um, Go ahead and go to that repository and hit the little fork button near the top. That'll give you a, your own private copy of the repository, and then you should be able to check that out and, and start, start playing around. Um, there's a readme in that repository that tells you how to configure um, your name for the competition, so you, your team name, basically. Um, and also, you need to set a token so that it knows um, how to associate your submission with your GitLab um, ID. Um, but there's there are instructions there. And I'll also go through it. I'll, I'll, I'll delete my own fork that I currently have and go through that process again so you can see what it looks like. Um, I really wish there was a, is there a bulk add? No? OK. Does anybody, anybody work at GitLab? Tell them to add a bulk add. Accept all. This is awesome. There are more coming in. Let's see if I can get the. I want to get the queue to be empty. <laughs> Did I do it? Okay, how many people are still going through the sign-up flow that are interested in competing? Um, so, so I'll, I'll show, I'll show you. Um, so, I'm going to go to projects. My own competition. I'm going to get rid of that for now. Uh, settings. Uh, projects. Okay. So if you go to the KDE 2017 search competition, hit the fork button right here. Um, do it under you. Eventually, this will finish. OK, and then you'll have your own um, so that everybody's code is separate and, and things are wonderful. Um, so now, um, we need to do a little, a little bit of setup work. I apologize for a lot of the moving parts, but once this is set up, I promise it's going to be really cool. Um, so we need to generate an access token um, to add to the um, CI process to help it identify who you are when it submits. Um, and then we'll also configure our name for the competition while we're at it. 
So what we're going to do is go up here to the user drop down and go to settings. It, the README also tells you to do this, so if you if you're if you fall behind, you should be all right. Uh, and I'll also walk around like once once we're doing the competition, I'll walk around and help answer questions. Um, so go to settings. There should be access tokens at the top. Go to that. And we're going to create a new one. Um, it doesn't really matter what you call it. Because I've made so many tokens at this point. Um, and please give it the read user permissions. That's all it needs. Just read user. So this is under the top right corner. Go down to the settings. At the top of settings, there's access tokens. And then create a new access token. I will do that. And I will publicly display how you can impersonate me for a second. Um, so go ahead and copy, copy that to your clipboard. Um, make sure you copied it to your clipboard, because you can't get to it again. You'll have to make a new one, um, which isn't hard, but make sure you copy it. Once you've done that, um, go back to your projects and find, I have so many projects here, but um, it will be, where is it? Here, this top one. All right, now we're going to go to settings on, on the repository. So we're looking at my search competition repository. We go to settings. Yeah, so this is the one that you forked, yeah. <coughs> so it'll be, it'll be you know, like your, your username here slash search competition. Um, and then go to settings. Um, and then there's a sub menu here. Go to pipelines. And then scroll down to secret variables. And this is where we're going to add the, the variables. So I believe it's uh, GitLab API token. And we set it to the value that we just copied from the previous thing. Add new variable. And then competition alias with whatever you want to call yourself in the competition. OK. Once you've done that, you should be able to just check out the code locally, make some changes to the, the search of, uh, search of alpha, um, Python file, Commit those, or uh, commit those changes, push it back to the repository, and you should have a build job kickoff. Yeah, yeah, okay, sure, yeah, yeah. So, um, right, so grab the key from set settings, access tokens, generate a new one with read user permissions, copy that key, go back to your forked repository, settings, in that sub menu, pipelines, and then scroll down, there should be secret variables yeah. and you set the key called GitLab API token spelled that way and then just paste your token here and then it's add new variable And then if I've gone too fast for the whole thing, I can start from the beginning and do the whole process. And walk through again. Yeah? Perhaps to start from the beginning, but at least how was it generated again? Yeah, OK. So um, I'll, just, I'll just go through it from the beginning again, just to help keep, catch everybody up to where we're at. So we're going to look for KDD 2017 search competition. We start by hitting that fork button. That'll eventually dump you into your uh, own project settings, uh, your own, your own repo repository here. Then we need to generate an access token. So we do that by going to the little upper right-hand corner, going to settings. So this is your profile settings. Um, go to access tokens. So it's upper right-hand corner, settings, access tokens. And then name it whatever you want to call it, and give it the read user permission. And then hit create personal access token. <laughs> yes, I can. Um, oops. Oh, there's lots of people I haven't done yet. Okay. All right. Back to. 
So again, upper right corner, settings. Once you're on settings, click access tokens, name your token, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter. Give it read user permissions and then hit create personal access token. That'll give you this here. Go ahead and copy that to your clipboard. Make sure you copy it to the clipboard because you can't get it again. You'll have to do this step again if you don't copy it, so copy it. Then go back to your repository. You can do that by going here to projects and looking for your project. It should be called your name slash search competition. So make sure you're on your fork. Then go to settings for the repository this time. So it's the settings on this sort of bar. And there, there should be a sub subheading pipelines. Go to pipelines. Underneath the shared runners stuff, there should be secret variables. Your secret variables, we're going to set two, two variables. You have to set one. You can leave the other one blank, and it'll just call you anonymous if you want to pretend that you're uh, an anonymous person. Um, but you're going to set GitLab API token, spelled exactly this way. And the value is going to be whatever you just copied your clipboard from that access token. And then you should be able to say add new variable. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, I think just leave it not protected. Um, I think I think we'll probably just stay on the master branch anyway, so it should be fine. But I don't think anybody's gonna have time to do feature branching. Okay, so we're gonna add that. I already I've already added it. That's why it's giving me an error. That's fine. Um, the other variable is called competition alias. And that's how you set your team name. And by default, if that one isn't set, it'll just call you anonymous on the leaderboard. So the, the most important thing to set is the, is the GitLab API token. And then once you're done, you should see the two, two things down here um, with some values. I realize that setups, the setup is a little involved. Um, I, this, it, this will be easier the second time, <laughs> if we have time for that. Has everybody gotten to that point? Is there any, any questions on setting up the pipeline configuration? Okay, if there, if there are, I'll walk around when we're doing the competition. I wanna show you how, like, like what that's gonna look like. Um, so once you've got all this stuff, all this stuff configured, um, you should be able to um, clone your repository. You may need to add an SSH key if you, if if, uh, uh, if you want to do that. You can also use HTTPS and just use your password. Um, if you're using Google login, I think you have to add an SSH key because you don't have a password. Um, you can do that. This is a similar way you do it for to for uh, uh, GitHub. Um, if people need help with that, I can come around. Uh, yeah. Oh, the, uh, it is, um, oops, where is that, okay. Settings, positive, nope, pipelines. Uh, and the two are called GitLab API token and competition alias. Spelled exactly these way. And I think they, the, the names should be in the readme too, so if you have the repository, you should be able to find them there, I think, unless I forgot to type them there. I'm going to split my screen for a sec. Uh, alias. Sorry, I can't, I can't make it any bigger. <laughs> or maybe I can. Hold on. No, I'll just switch. Okay. Um, Um, whatever you want your uh, team name to be. Question? 
Menschen. Ja. Um, how did you sign in? How, how did you register? Um, so for Google accounts, you're going to have to add an SSH key because you don't have a password. So um, are, what, is, what is your platform? OK, great. So um, do, you do you have an SSH key? Yeah, so um, not the private key, public key. Just the public key. Um, don't give me your private key. That's bad. Um, so go, go upper right-hand corner, settings, and there should be SSH keys. And you just add it here. So you know you do grab your public key and then paste that there. Sorry? Oh, the group? Yeah. Okay, so I, I have my, my repository checked out locally. I've set my access token um, and my competition alias to just be my first name. Um, so I'm going to um, just do a very, very simple first submission. If you open up searcheval.py, um, this is just a skeleton that I've given you in case you want to um, fill in. Oops, I made a mistake. This should say... You can also grab the, this, it's the same skeleton that was in the, in the IPython notebook, so if you go to the KDD tutorial web page, it's also there. Um, that's if you wanted to find your own ranker in Python. I'm going to take the easy way out and just use a built-in ranker. So by default, you can see it's using Jelenic Mercer. This is the function you want to change. Um, so I'm going to just switch it to use, um, what should I use, Cheng? Deerslay prior? Uh, yeah. I'll just use a d default Deerslay prior which I think sets mu to like 1,000. Um, I'm going to test it here real quick. So um, the data set is Cranfield. So um, you'll want to either symlink or copy the, the Cranfield data set that we downloaded earlier to here. Um, because I'm feeling particularly lazy, I'm just going to go search for Cranfield, grab this. Paste it here, get rid of the bang, and extract the data set. But that's just the same data set we had before. Um, and you can just make sure your stuff is working by doing, um, oh, I need my virtual environment. No, no. Uh, source. Don't have to do that. That's just I was using it in a virtual environment. Um, Python search config. Oh, there should be a. There's a requirements at txt. So if you need if you need to download dependencies, you can use that. So my ranker is doing something. It's not erroring out. It's working. So now I'm going to commit this. Yeah. Yeah. So it's git. So remember, commit and push. Now that I've pushed to my repository, I'm going to go back to the website. Um, 
go to my project, search competition. So here, um, under pipelines, I should be able to see the CI job that's running. So there's one job called competition, and I can see the actual command line output. Say succeeded, and now I can go to the leaderboard URL, which is a horrible, terrible URL. Please don't try and type it manually. There's a link in the README right here. But we can see a number of people have already submitted, which is great. So this will update in real time as people are submitting their results. So the evaluation here, I'm using two different data sets. One is that Cranfield data set that we were playing with earlier, with, and it's, it's weighted as, as uh, 0.3 of the score. And the other 0.7 of the score is from an actual uh, information retrieval data set called AP News. Um, it's a small, a small uh, track style data set, but it is a track style data set. Um, so this is actually a real retrieval data set that people will use in practice um, to test retrieval algorithms on. Um, and we're evaluating based on uh, NDCG at 10, which is just a particular information retrieval uh, measurement. Um, right, cool. Um, any questions generally for the group? Otherwise, I'm going to walk around and make sure that everybody's like set up and working. Can you tell people how um, to change the parameters just to get different numbers? Sure, yeah. You have? Yeah, I can do that. Um, so I'm going to go to um, a new workspace. and Yeah, so you'll notice that if you change parameters of some of these methods, the results would actually be often very different. And those algorithms are sensitive to the setting of parameters. And a lot of data scientists spend a lot of time also on tuning parameters and optimizing parameters. So those are part of the variations that you could try, easy to try. Question? Sorry? Um, to, to, the, to the folder with the repository, so just right in here. Um, just just uh, the actual raw data, the Cranfield. Okay, so um, let's try let's try tweaking a parameter. So this has no slides. So I'm just going to open up the help for Deer Site prior to figure out, okay, what are the what are the parameters that this thing this thing takes? Oh, okay. So it has a def it has a default parameter mu um, for Deer Site prior, which indicates sort of the level of uh, of uh, um, Bayesian smoothing um, to use here, um, and you can sort of interpret that that mu as like the number of pseudo counts that you're using to smooth things with. Um, so the performance of the algorithm will vary depending on the setting of this particular parameter. Lots of the, if you look at any of the other functions that are built in, and there's a lot. Um, they all have different sets of parameters that you might want to play with and tune. So I'll just try changing the value of mu. Um, let's try just mu is 1,000. It looked like the default was 2,000, so let's just have it. Let's see what happens. So we can see uh, mean average precision is 0.229 on Cranfield with mu is 1,000. I'll just make a new window. Um, let's compare that to what it was at default and see if it did any better. Okay, it looks like on at least on Cranfield, a smaller value of mu led to a, a better mean average precision. So I'm going to try and commit this result to see if I did any better on the leaderboard. 
Oh, I, um, I undid my change. <laughs> Mu is 1,000. And once I've pushed, I should be able to go to my repository, go to pipelines, and see the new job that's running. Hey, I did better. Oh no, I'm beating everyone. <laughs> Try BM25. <laughs> it turns out to be really, really difficult to beat BM25 in practice. <laughs> um, so in, in practice, right, you would, in order, uh, figuring out how to set these parameters is, is pretty important. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Um, the simple heuristic way is kind of what we're doing, what I'm doing here, just trying different values, a, man, a human manual grid search. Um, but uh, there are other, other techniques for doing this sort of thing. Um, you know, for example, you could try learning to rank, which is essentially trying to figure out how to combine different ranking functions together um, to figure out what's the optimal weighting for each of these sort of, sorts of things. Um, you can define uh, a loss to update the weights for each ranking function and automatically construct a new ensemble ranking function from a collection of ranking functions. Um, you can also incorporate different features in learning to rank sort of things. Um, if you're doing this in practice, it's, it, it's, um, I'm sort of being, I'm cheating a little bit here because I'm tuning my parameter on the entire data. Typically what you'll do is you'll separate your data set into a couple parts, right? You'll have one part that you use um, for, you know, creating, creating the index for the, the um, and then you'll, you'll have a separate, um, you'll take your query, sorry, you'll take your query set, right, um, and use part of that to figure out what your optimal parameter setting should be, and then test on the remaining part of the query file, right? Here I'm testing, I'm testing the, my, my ranking function on the entire, um, on the entire uh, data set, so it's not, not quite accurate. But. Yeah, but, but, but here you can see you tune on a small data set here, Cranfield, and then you try to kind of test on AP, which, which is what you have not seen, right? So you can yeah. see sometimes the order is different. The, the best performance, uh, uh, the no. best parameter you have found on Cranfield is not necessarily working the best uh, for the AP data. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an idea, this is kind of the, the level of performance that you can get if, uh, if you're motivated by, uh, if you're a motivated undergrad by uh, uh, using grades as a, a metric for making sure you care. Um, you can improve things quite a bit from sort of these, these simple baselines that we're starting off at. So there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, and this is actually the exact same experiment that we ran um, for uh, a bunch of students uh, that were taking Chang's information retrieval class. Um, they use this, this same system to, to do a uh, large scale, well, semi-large scale. This is a little bigger maybe. No, 410 four is bigger, I think. Um, yeah. Um, so also, these, these methods are actually very close to state-of-the-art method that does not require additional knowledge about the data set. So if you have links of web pages, you can probably use page rank and other algorithms to improve the performance. But if you don't make those assumptions, these algorithms are pretty much the state-of-the-art algorithms. And some of these methods actually perform very well in the medical record search um, competition some years ago. When, um, so so these are fairly good um, methods that you could consider using for your application as a starting point. Also the design of this virtual lab architecture that Chase explained is uh, motivated by the need for doing a lot of these experiments on the cloud. So the data set of AP here is not very large but uh, the infrastructure can support a huge data set that um, would allow people to work together on improving the method. And this can be useful for a company inside a company where you have multiple groups working on the same problem or in the open manner as we're doing here. You can you, you feel free to do more later and 
you know, if you can invent a new method that can beat these methods, you may be able to publish your paper because the, these represent the state of the art. So I'm going to leave all this infrastructure running um, until um, probably sometime after I get back to Urbana. So if people want to continue playing around with this, um, please feel free to do so. Um, I'm going to give you maybe a couple more minutes um, and then start talking about um, sort of applications that use the other form of index, which is the forward index. So this is going to be things like classification, clustering, um, topic modeling, that sort of thing. I just want to make sure you have enough time to actually, you know, get your hands dirty, play around with some of this stuff, see if you can improve it. Somebody beat me. Come on. <laughs> um, if you want a list of ranking functions um, that we have, oh, that's a demo. Well, but I think this actually has a good list, actually. So if this is still running, which I think it is, yeah, this, isn't, this isn't all the ranking functions. Try pivot to the length normalization as well. Uh, yeah. So here's kind of the, from the C++ side of things, this is kind of the list of, of all the different ranking functions we have. Um, so um, Rockio and KL Divergence are kind of uh, a little bit, a little bit of a special case because they do, um, uh, pseudo relevance feedback, so they need to actually customize the actual score functions. That's why they're higher up in this hierarchy. Ranking functions, on the other hand, are ones that you can implement with just score one, and here's a bunch of, uh, of those broken down into sort of different components. So um, from the language model work, um, um, lots of different smoothing methods for um, 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 query likelihood methods. Um, and then uh, we have a couple uh, standard vector space models. Um, Okapi is uh, still sort of one of the, like if you're looking for a default ranking function in the absence of any, uh, any other knowledge, uh, Okapi is a pretty good bet. Um, and if you, if you care a little bit more about recall, um, trying one of Rockio or KL Divergence pseudo relevance feedback is a good idea. You're sort of tra when you start incorporating pseudo relevance judgments, you have trade offs between. Because the pseudo-relevance judgment, basically the idea there is to, to take your query, which has probably only got a couple words in it, and try and, in some automated way, mm -hmm. figure out what other words probably should have been in this query, right? Because if the, if the query, if the set of query words is too small, um, you're not going to find anything in the inverted index because you're only looking for two different words. But if you could expand that in an intelligent way, you could expand the list of documents you're considering and then start to get better results. Um, but the trade-off there is you might add words that aren't, aren't as relevant, so you might get more irrelevant results. You might return more results that are relevant, but there may be more irrelevant results near the top. Um, so there's kind of this trade-off between which one of these things you want to do. Do you want to show the web demos that they can actually know they can build an actual search engine yeah, sure. by using the um, with the interface? So you can actually set up a search engine for your data. Just so we've got, a couple, we've got a couple running demos here um, that I can show uh, at this point. Um, I honestly don't know if this one's working right now, but I'm going to try it. Okay. Yeah. So this is just a real search engine running. We can sort of play with different ranking functions. Um, so you can actually build build real applications here. I think this is using an old version. I think there's some some issues with the the index here, but that's that's fine. Um, the one I'm most proud of, because it's fun, is the natural language processing demo application. Because oh, my sentence is too long. Okay, too verbose. There, try that. Yeah. Okay. So. You know, this is this kind of gives you uh, the some of that stuff we were doing programmatically in the IPython notebook. Um, this gives you a web interface to kind of play around with some of that. It's the same models that we were using before. Um, shows you, you know, how the how the sentence is broken down into individual tokens, including the pen tree bank normalizer, um, how it was tagged, and then the constituency parse where you can kind of hover over nodes and see, you know, this is these are all the things that are in the verb phrase. These are all the things in the noun phrase, etc. 
Um, and if you give it long, if you give it longer, multiple sentences, it'll parse each sentence and show you a different row in this table. Um, this is just sort of a demonstration of the NLP stuff. Um, Cheng mentioned uh, using um, PageRank. We have a PageRank impl implementation, and this uh, this this is using the C++ side of things, but um, you can do um, PageRank stuff. Um, so you could incorporate that as a feature in your in your uh, ranking function. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, um, please go ahead and continue playing around with the competition. I'm going to look. All right, somebody beat me. Cool. Good. Oh, somebody tied me. Someone did exactly what I did. Okay. Yeah, this is this was actually I think uh, Sean Massung, the other author of the toolkit, was uh, egging the undergrads on to try and push them to to try a little bit harder. Um, yeah, another nice feature is that if, if you really deploy this kind of toolkit and you have identified a good method, that method can actually be used in the web demo immediately. Yeah. Right, so. Yeah, and if, if you go to our GitHub, I think we have, a, we have like a MetaPy demos um, repository that shows you how to do, like the, the source code for that search engine and, and the NLP demo are in a repository. So you can see exactly how to bridge the gap between Okay, this is a nice library that we can play around with in a notebook, but how do I actually use it in, a, in an actual system? All right, so in the interest, in the interest of time, I'm going to switch back to the notebook um, and start talking about um, doing things with the other kind of index, which is the, the forward index. Scroll through my notes here. This is done that. Okay. So let's do some classification. All right, I'm going to grab another data set here real quick. This is another small sort of a, um, um, not, I mean, it's, it's not quite a toy data set, but it's pretty close to a toy data set, um, but it's, it's uh, an interesting classification task because it's like you always hear about uh, from you know the standard classification tasks like is this a positive or negative review or you know is this a positive or negative sentiment tweet or whatever this is this is the, uh, an interesting one where um, you have a bunch of documents and your goal is to uh, is is to predict um, what the native language of the speaker was who produced the document um, so there um, there are uh, I think three labels here Japanese. Chinese and English, um, and the goal is to try and tease out from just the English text that they wrote what their native background was. Um, I already have the stop words list. Um, I'm just going to make a quick configuration file for this data set. Um, it's in the current working directory. It's called CIOS. It's a line corpus. I'm using the stop word list we had before, and I'm just going to use unigram words because I'm just starting off. And I can create an index much the same way as I did the inverted index. I just search replace inverted for forward. And we can create a, a forward index. So the difference is the, the inverted index gives you a mapping from term ID to lists of document IDs and their counts, how many times that document contained that term or that feature. Um, in the forward index, it's the opposite. It's mapping from a document ID to here are all the terms that the document contained and their frequencies. Um, when I'm doing unigram words, and if I'm doing other feature representations, it's counts of features. So it's basically a mapping from doc ID to features. Um, but it's persisted to disk, so you can load it later, and you can load parts of it rather than loading it all at once. Um, you're in control of how much memory you're actually allocating. Um, in this case, this is a really small data set, so I'm just going to load the whole thing into RAM. Um, um, yep, there were three labels in this data set. So, um, I want to do a quick classification task, so um, I'm going to create a data set from this index. Um, since there are three labels, it's going to be a multi-class classification problem, so I'm going to make a multi-class data set. So 
so that'll go ahead and load in all of the documents in the data set into memory so that I can do um, <coughs> machine learning on them. Um, so in, in practice, um, we want to sort of separate the data set into parts, right? One for training, one for testing. Um, so we can do that by um, using this, the Python slicing operators on this. You can treat this as a, as a, as a, uh, a range, basically, and say, um, I'm going to make a training set of, I forget how I did this. Oh, right, OK. Right. So what I'm going to what I'm going to do is is two things. Um, so the, the architecture of the of the classification part of Meta is designed to make it so that we're not we're going to try and conserve memory with that data set because it's probably pretty huge. Um, so if we're trying to construct subsets of the data set, we're not going to actually copy any of the instances because that's going to consume way too much RAM. So what we do instead is we create views over the data set that we can then do operations on. So you can shuffle a data you can shuffle a data set without actually shuffling the document representations that are in RAM, and this can save you quite a bit of RAM. So we're going to make a view first. So all is a keyword. Okay. Um, Okay, so now I have a view over my data set. So now I can do things to this view that don't change my data set. So I can say something like, please shuffle the data set view. Um, and then, so now I've got a shuffled version of my data set. Um, you know, so so now I can now I can say things like I want to if I wanted to create a randomized training and test split over my documents to try and see how how well my model is doing, I can do that by taking my data set, creating a view over that data set to shuffle that, and then taking subsets of that view. Yeah, that makes sense, <coughs> right? And no, and, and nowhere here did I actually need to move around the documents in RAM. I'm just keeping pointers into everything. Um, so let's create a training set. And let's say, let's do 75% training, 25% testing. Um, so we'll do len of set view um, times 0 0.75. There's probably a better way to do that. I don't really care at this point. Just trying to get results. Int, boom. And then testing. Nope, I should have done. I need to do it over over the view, which has already been shuffled. And we'll do starting from there to the end. Okay, so now I've got my training and testing sets. So now I can train a classifier and then see how well I did on that on on that prediction task. Um, so let's just start with a very simple model, naive Bayes. Um, uh, in Meta, um, creating a classifier entails either training it or loading it from a file. So if you have a classifier, it has been trained. Um, so when we do this, it's going to actually train this classifier on this training set, which went really fast. And now we can say, um, naive Bayes, please test on my testing data set. And this will give me a confusion matrix. If I print the confusion matrix, I can see you know, which, which things I am doing well on, which things I'm not, and how I'm, how I'm confusing the different labels. So this is good for doing sort of uh, evaluation of where, where the classifier is making mistakes. We also have. a number of different um, statistics that are collected from running the, uh, the testing. So we can see what's the distribution of labels. This is really important to sort of get an idea of what the baseline is. You know, here we can see that the majority of the data set is actually native Japanese. Um, so if you were to just predict Japanese, you would get a 72% accuracy. 
right? So that's, that's the lowest possible baseline you could ever have if you just predicted the majority class. So it gives you some diagnostic information. Um, you can see the precision and recall on F1 score. Um, the total F1 score here is, is the weighted average here, depending on the, the total uh, number of labels. Or, sorry, total, total number of instances in that class. So it's, it's proportionally weighted based on that. Um, and then we can see our overall accuracy was 96. It's pretty good. Um, let's try a different model. Um, I don't know if we're going to be able to beat 96, though, but we'll try. The, the fun, fun thing about this is when, when you're doing the shuffling, right, you get slightly different results each time, so I don't actually know what's going to happen here. Um, but let's try, a stronger, let's try a stronger classifier. Let's do uh, a linear SVM. Um, this is a very, very common um, baseline classifier that everybody uses. Um, in order to do that, um, the, the way to do that in meta is to use the stochastic gradient descent um, classifier, which is a binary classifier. Um, so it's able to predict positive or negative, and that's it. Um, and we're going to wrap that with an ensemble that does uh, one versus all or one versus one reduction. Um, so you can, for any multi-class classification problem, you can translate that into a series of binary classification problems and then have an ensemble to, to unify the result. Um, so that's what we're going to do here. Um, so we're going to create a, a one versus all. You know, I'm just going to copy it, I think. Fine. So to construct one versus all, we have to give it a um, data set view to train on, and then uh, a number of uh, additional arguments to pass down to the individual uh, classifiers that are going to be inside of this ensemble. So so we're going to do on the training set, um, and then da -da -da. Just the same as some typing. So we're going the, the base classifier inside of the reduction is going to be an SGD based classifier on the hinge loss. Um, it's a subgradient method to avoid the fact that the hinge loss isn't differentiable. It doesn't matter. Um, it does very well in practice. Um, okay, so I can train this and I can test it. get a confusion matrix. And see how this did. 96.8, what was our other one? 96.4, so probably not a statistically significant jump at all. Um, there are, um, we can do a McNemer test um, that's built in here if we wanted to do that. Um, but. Let's take a look here. I wonder if this did the same thing that I expected it to do. Um, do, do. Yeah, so here is here was some results I had um, before. Um, where um, you can see when I'm trying to make sure I'm reading the each row tells you the, the true the, the true label and then what it was actually assigned to the column. So when the document was Chinese, 86% of the time it was assigned Chinese and then um, Nine percent of the time, it was it was being confused as a Japanese essay. That might have something to do with the fact that the underlying data distribution is skewed towards um, Japanese, right? So it has a pretty strong naive Bayes will have a pretty strong prior that says this is probably Japanese. So it's it's possibly going to make errors like that. Um, so you can use the output of the uh, confusion matrices to understand how your classifier is doing. So the, you can see the same problems happening here with the the SVM, right? Um, the <laughs> when a document was written by a Chinese student, 
Um, Thirteen percent of the time, it's actually predicting it as uh, as being Japanese instead. But our overall accuracy improved. Um, but the interestingly, the naive Bayes model didn't didn't make this didn't make this mistake at all. So it's different algorithms will give you different trade-offs, um, and the confusion matrix provides a nice way of being able to um, evaluate that. Um, what else do I want to talk about? Do I do the stats? I don't want to do... Um, okay. Um, so it, for, for people who are interested... Um, actually, I want to check the results. Did anybody beat me yet? No, okay. People are following along. Okay, that's fine. Um, so there, there is a, uh, another competition if you're interested. Um, it's, it's set up in, in sort of the exact same way. Um, using the same infrastructure um, for doing a uh, native language identification task on a data set that's similar to CIOS but is a little bit bigger. Um, but still the goal is to predict what's the native language of someone who wrote an English article. Um, there are a lot more labels in the, in the uh, data set that are, is being used in the competition. So if you're uh, interested in playing around with that, um, go ahead and have a look there. Um, if you're a member of the KDD 2017 group, you should be able to see the other competition repository. It's classify competition or classification competition. Fork that. Follow the same procedures last time um, to get that set up. Um, in the interest of making sure that I cover sort of the last major application I wanted to talk about today, I'm just going to launch into that. Um, and that is topic modeling. So um, another thing you can do with the forward index, so topic modeling, um, the goal here is to try and uncover um, a couple things. Um, the first is uh, what are the in what are the high level themes that are captured in the corpus. So, um, if I run a topic model on some corpus, um, for and I, and I say I think there are probably um, k different themes. That's a parameter that you have to decide in advance. Um, there are methods for getting rid of that parameter, but I'm not going to go into them today. Um, I'm just going to talk about sort of uh, the most standard. Um, topic modeling, um, which assumes that K is a parameter. So I say, okay, I have this corpus. I want to find, you know, three latent themes. Um, so I take my corpus and I train a topic model, and it'll give me <coughs> K different distributions over the words in the corpus, and each of these distributions encompasses one of the themes that were found that was found in the data. So the words that are in one of these theme distributions or the topics. Um, will be semant hopefully semantically co coherent. Right? They, they co-occur in the same kind of documents together. Um, the other thing it extracts for you is um, document representations. So this is, again, something that you could use to I improve your document representation for classification. Um, and the, the document rep representation is every document mentions one of these K themes with some proportion. So this document maybe is 50% about um, you know, sports and 50% about uh, finance. Maybe it's talking about um, trade caps or something. Um, or maybe this article is, you know, some percentage about machine learning, some percentage about, uh, about statistics, and some percentage about, um, you know, algorithmic theory. And it's, a, it's a paper about convergence or something. Um, so for every document, I can extract, you know, how, how, how prevalent is each one of these K themes in this document. So every document then can be represented as a length K vector, um, where the values are the probability of that particular theme being exhibited in that document, right? So you get a proportion. Um, so you can do a number of things with this. The, the topics themselves are very, very useful for getting a sense of what's in a corpus, what is this thing about, what, what, uh, what is in here. Um, and the document representations are useful for doing things like browsing, um, classification, clustering. You can cluster based on the actual vec the proportion vectors. Do you do k-means or something on that? Um, you could also just use LDA directly to sort of get um, for each of these themes. These are the documents that mention this theme, so you can create topic browsers and stuff like this. So it's a very it's a very nice unsupervised method for um, creating sort of a, a, a nice representation of your corpus. So let, let's let's do let's do some topic modeling. Um, the, the algorithms for topic modeling in meta are all um, variants of, of uh, inference for uh, latent Dirichlet allocation. Um, uh, probably 
within a month or so, I'm going to add just a vanilla implementation of PLSA, um, which is a slightly less complicated model, but is essentially the same idea. Um, but let's start with, with let's start with the LDA for now. <clears throat> so. Um, I'm going to load in just an unlabeled data set because this is unsupervised. It doesn't know anything about labels. Um, and I'm just going to use the same, the same index I had before, so this is still that CIOS data set. That's these essays written by students that may or may not be native English speakers. Um, and I want to figure out, you know, what, are, what were the themes here? So I'm going to do that by... Let's use this particular inference method. Why? Because I don't know. I think that's what I used before. Um, and then what did I? Max iterations. You know what? I'm just going to grab that. <coughs> In the interest of time, I'm just going to do that. OK. So I'm going to create a um, collapse variational Bayes inferencer for LDA on the data set that I just loaded in. Um, because this data set's really, really small and I happen to know something about it, I'm going to set k to 2. Um, and I'm going to set the, uh, hyper, the, the um, parameters for the uh, priors for the word distributions and the topic proportions, flip that, um, respectively, as alpha and beta. Um, so if I wanted um, less smoothing of the topic proportions, I'd set this to a smaller value. And then I'm going to go ahead and run this for either a thousand iterations or until it converges for some appropriate convergence criteria for this particular inference algorithm. So if I go ahead and run that, it'll go and churn for a bit. Um, should finish in probably, I think, like a hundred iterations or so. Yeah, all right. So it eventually, you know, as it's running, it's printing out some diagnostic information about the maximum change in its parameter vector. This is just sort of internal implementation details. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it finishes. It says it's converged. Um, we can now save the inferred topic proportions for every document and the inferred topics themselves to a file that we can then load later and play around with. So let's do that. So LDA inf dot save LDA perhaps variational base. Um, And I'm going to load the query model now. So it's the, this process is kind of separated into two parts because in practice, um, you know, fitting these LDA models can take quite a bit of time if you're doing it on a big corpus. Um, so the idea here is that you can run that offline and then have us load in the inferred results and do things with those um, so you can sort of separate out these two tasks. So maybe, you know, if you're, if you're you know, dealing with an evolving corpus and you're not using one of the online variants, you could, you know, refit the topic model, uh, you know, every so many new documents that you create or something. Um, but now we have, now that we have this model, we can query and, and get some uh, interesting information about out, out of it. So um, perhaps the first thing is what are the topics? Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, grab... So I want to grab the top uh, k words, I think, I forget what the default is, probably 10, um, for topic 0, just to see what the what, what is topic 0 about. Um, it gives me, well, it's about 3,759 3, in this proportion, because these are term IDs. So I need to translate the term IDs into actual, uh, actual text so I can interpret that. Um, I just have a quick comprehension to do that. So what I'm doing is get the top k, iterate for all the pairs. I'm going to use the forward index. I think it's f underscore in my notebook to just grab the term text for this term ID and then just keep the probability value. So all this is doing is basically it's a it's a fancy way of saying loop through that list and change all the IDs to text. What do I get? All right. So this is to, this is topic zero, and this is topic. These topics look pretty good. Totally not because this is a particularly cherry-picked example. Um, I happened to know in advance uh, and, and abuse that knowledge. This, uh, this essay data set 
um, the students were allowed to pick from two different essay prompts. Can you guess what the essay prompts were? So if you picked, if you picked this essay prompt, what were you writing about? Yeah, part-time jobs. It was, it, was, it was, you know, is it important for, for students to have part-time jobs? You know, argue for or against, you know, uh, students in college having part-time jobs. Um, and then what about this one? Yeah, smoking bans in restaurants, right? Public smoking. Um, so, um, There should be a, oh no, <laughs> searching the whole thing. There is a comment earlier. There's a command that gives me the average document line. Maybe it's only on the inverted index. That would be the sensitivity requirements for short text. Yes. Do you have any uh, variations of the variations of the average 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 of the yeah, the clustering model would likely work well. Yeah, so I can. I'm Arsenal definitely. Has yeah, yeah, the the the, PL, the the PLSA variant basically. Yeah. Yeah, not at the moment. I just have vanilla LDA, but that's I I'm I am aware of that pain point. So I would so love that, to. I that love just, to. That kind of problem would likely require different model. The LDA model assumes a text can 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 include the multiple topics. And for that kind of short text, you have to make assumption that. It, it should be about just one topic, and that if you impose that assumption, then the, a similar model would likely work better. Okay, there, so there. Sure, sure. <laughs> it was about 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 ninety eight. Ninety eight words. So, what was your question? What I was saying was, I mean, you have all the words or Right. Yeah. 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 And there's a number of. In, in fact, in fact, I think that's kind of where I was going next. Is like now. Now that we know that these two topics correlate with the essay topics, um, if we look at the document proportions, we should be able to find documents that have a really high proportion in one and a low proportion in the other, and that should tell us something about what they wrote about. Yeah, you can also use these distributions as train models to, to further classify additional text in any way that you like. Yeah. yeah, but that would be supervised. Though. Yeah, it was kind of supervised by the learner models. Based on, uh, you create the things from unsupervised text, and then, yeah, then supervised learning on top. Yeah, so here are, here are two documents that I happened to look up before that I knew have different topic proportions, but you can see you know, very clearly, if you were to use this this representation to figure out what what the essay of a of a what the essay prompt for a particular document was, you'd do pretty well because it's you have pretty stark differences between if it's about one, it really truly has most of the probability mass on one of those topics. Um, so there are a lot of interesting things you can do here. Um, in practice, when you're fitting LDA, you're going to use more than two topics because you're fitting LDA on something that's not a toy data set. Um, but you can do but similar things apply, right? You can figure out, you know, what's the propensity of this particular, um, you know, uh, review about a particular aspect of a product that it's about, you know. But like, what if if my if my topics, you know, end up representing things like the different aspects of a product? I can see, you know, this review was really bad, but why? You know, is it a is it it's bad because it's it's a negative review and it's also about this particular aspect of the product. So that gives you some more insight like that. So there's lots of cool variants of this uh, kind of uh, approach um, to uh, to try um, 
for doing a, a number of different analysis ta tasks. Um, So um, for, for LDA, uh, I don't. Um, evaluating topic models is sort of really hard. Um, uh, so, and this is a good point, right? Because it's, um, you don't necessarily have ground truth. Like here, here, maybe there's something reasonable I could do if I have a label that, you know, I know each essay is about a particular topic. I can maybe ev evaluate how good my model is by looking at the, you know, topic proportions for each document. And know, I know what the right answer should be, and I can see how it deviates from that. Um, but in general, it's, it's tough to do this. Um, in practice, I think the best thing people have come up with is honestly to run user studies, um, which is unsatisfying because that's so expensive to do. But um, it's, it's f coming up with a robust evaluation metric for topic models has been elusive, I think. Um, you know, just looking at held out test set perplexity doesn't correlate with what with whether people think these topics are meaningful. For example, right? You can have you can have a topic model that fit that you know, wow, the perplexity on my held out data is really great, but the topics are absolutely not meaningful to people, and then that kind of hurts its usability. It really depends on what you're using it for, too. So it's tough. So I don't I don't have one built in, but I, I I'm I'm skeptical whether there is even one that is reasonable to implement. Um, if you know of one, let me know though. Um, held out perplexity, is, I'm not convinced that that's, that's necessarily useful. Okay. So like the, the how, how, separate, how separate the topics are. Yeah, you can do, you can do things. Yeah, I can do things like that. Um, yeah, because I, yeah, I, I think, think there I are many applications of labor. such techniques. So you treat this as a tool to extend your own uh, ability to see patterns in data. And you, you're supposed to, I think, use your knowledge to direct the tool, just like when you're using a microscope, you want to see different things. And here, you, there are some ways to tune the topic. You can impose, for example, constraints like, uh, I want these words to have high probabilities for this topic, I want those words to have high probabilities for another topic, and these models can kind of listen to your instructions to, to tune the topics as you, as you want. And then you can, again, evaluate this in your application. For example, if you use this to transform the representation in the case of a classification task, you can use its impact on some task downstream to assess the quality, if that's what you want. If you want to interpret the topics themselves, then you could imagine a system that would visualize the, you know, the articles or allow you to click on some topics to get into the actual content about those topics to, to summarize them and then to understand it in an interactive way. Yeah. Um, so uh, you can, um, we have so uh, in the C++, um, I believe you can specify a particular, um, uh, uh, what's the word, dense, prior. dense Dirichlet prior. So you can, you can um, instead of, uh, or sorry, uh, sparse Dirichlet prior. So it's instead, instead of saying like all, all the values in the prior are the same value of alpha or beta, um, you can actually say, for each term ID, I want the value of the prior to be this. Um, if you do that, that's a way. Of, that's a way of seeding it. It's not. Um, there are. I mean, there are different approaches. This may work, um, but it's also possible if you seed it like this. It's if if you if there's enough if you have enough data points, your data can overwhelm your prior, and it can still end up with topics that don't reflect what your seeds are. But if you set that if you set the concentrations of the individual spots in the Dirichlet like vector. High enough, um, it should it should force it to kind of align with what you expect the topics to be. So you could try that. I don't think I've exposed the non non dense Dirichlet priors in the Python implementation. I'd have to look, but I there it should be robust to that. There should be you should be able to specify what your prior is for the individual topics. We're also still working on adding new models. <coughs> excuse me to the toolkits. For example, there are models that would compa compare multiple collections. Let's say reviews of similar products, and then try to look for the common patterns and, and the variations of those topics in different products. So there are advanced models that we are hoping to put in, and we hope when uh, people know more about the toolkit, that other people can help us 
also get more tools into the toolkit. So we're almost out of time. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, quickly um, just do just just demonstrate the um, applicability of some of the more advanced NLP features that we talked about for text classification tasks. Um, so I'm gonna participate in my own competition. Um, oops. Or you want to show what a batting result? Um, no, we don't have it. Um, I I have it here. Oh. Yeah, yeah, no, the, the, um, word embeddings are there. I can I'll, I'll get there. Um, okay. So, I'm going to add, for the, co the, the classification competition, I'm going to add um, some semi-skeleton tree features. <laughs> so those were the ones where they look like, they look like giant you know, piles of parentheses, but we keep the root constituent. Um, so, um, <coughs> features is semi Skill. Uh, parser is parser. Uh, data models parser. Uh, data models. Um, perceptron tagger. Uh, and then I feel like I'm missing something. What, else, what am I missing? Oh, the filter chain, of course. <laughs> Start with an IC tokenizer. And then follow with an filter bank compromiser. That's all I need, right? Let's try that. Hopefully that will run. While that's while that's going, um, there are there are a number of other things that the toolkit supports that I didn't have time to talk about today. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go through some of the things on the website that um, may be interesting to people. Um, so we did we did talk about um, you know basic text analysis, tokenizers and filters, search classification. We didn't talk about online learning, um, but uh, the that SGD um, implementation of the linear SVM that we were using um, is a stochastic gradient descent algorithm, which means it can support online learning. Um, so in, in the case where you have a really, really, really big data set that you can't possibly load all into RAM like we did our toy data set, um, what you can do is um, load parts of it into RAM at a time, do some sort of, use mini batches, right, to create mini batches of, of, of samples of your, of your giant data set. Um, to help train the, the classifier like that, so you can support um, classification on data sets that don't fit in don't fit in RAM even remotely. Um, and there is um, in the uh, as part of the C plus plus toolkit, we have a just a built-in example code that shows you how to actually do that in practice. Um, so here it's taken a giant, uh, uh, not, uh, this isn't a really big data set, but it's, it's big enough that I tested in a Docker container by, by really shrinking the memory requirements to make sure that this is actually working. Um, but it broke it down into 14 batches, and so it trained, trained the model progressively on each of the 14 batches. Um, so you can do that if you, if you have really big data sets. We talked about parse speech tagging and, and parsing. Um, we talked a little bit about topic models. We have a bunch of different variants of topic model inference. Um, so I just, I used my favorite, which is collapse variational Bayes. But if you're if you are uh, more of a sampling kind of person, there's a, there's a collapse give sampling. Um, if you uh, really need results as quickly as possible, there's parallelized version of collapse give sampling that is an approximation, but it's a pretty good one. Um, so if you if you really need some LDA topic model results on some data very quickly, you can try uh, using one of the parallel implementations. Um, 
we have uh, language models, um, so uh, we don't have, we, we currently can't infer language models, but we, you can use a trained language model as a feature for, for, for other sorts of things. Um, so this was done in work to try and identify, um, try and create a representation of documents by looking at how they changed from some sort of reference corpus. This was again sort of in the, in the case of non-native non uh, text analysis, which was one of Sean Massing's kind of signature things that he was doing. Um, where we used, used a language model to figure out like what, what parts of, of a non-native English speaker's essay look strange compared to a, you know, uh, n-gram language model um, and did some sort of edit distance kind of optimization to figure out what changes to make to it to improve the, the perplexity. Um, but we have, we have a, uh, implementa a couple different implementations of language models, um, one of which is based on uh, minimal perfect hashing. Um, which creates fairly small language models in, in RAM. Um, it's not as good as some toolkits that are specifically designed just for language modeling, but it's pretty close. Um, its performance is not as good uh, in terms of speed. But um, so we have we have language models. If you need if you need to be able to assess you know the surprise of a particular piece of text or something, you want to use um, n-gram language models. We have those. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, word embeddings. We have word embeddings. Um, the, if, you, if you grab the latest version of the toolkit from the development branch, we have an implementation of both Glove and uh, Skipgram word to vec um, If you grab the current version of the toolkit, it just has Glove. The word to vec stuff just landed very recently. Um, but the idea here, and we have, we, we have some pre-trained word embeddings on just some uh, large-ish uh, large uh, English corpora. Um, so if you're doing English stuff, uh, we have some embeddings for that. Pre-trained, um, but the idea here is, basically, if, if you're not familiar with word embeddings, is is to take each of the discrete words that you've you've obtained from your collection uh, and map that to a low-dimensional, real-valued vector space where words that are some, that are semantically similar end up in similar spaces in this in this vector space. So you can, you know, use this as a way of sort of abstracting out from the representation of a word as being an individual thing because you have, you know, dog and cat are semantically similar in some sense, right? Because they're both, they're, they both can be pets. Um, but if you treat them as separate features like we do in bag of words, your classifier is not going to learn how to transfer knowledge from cat to dog. Um, whereas if you're using embeddings, you can do something like this. So this, there's some cute, cute little demos um, for that that I don't have time to show. Um, but we also have word embeddings. There's also, I must have skipped somewhere in here, we have, I mentioned it briefly, we have um, some graph algorithms. Um, so if you need to do things like evaluating centrality of documents, if you're looking at a document link network or something, you can do, do, do similar things um, with that. Um, okay, good. So I think this was I don't know, that's three submissions. I don't know. I must not have set my name. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, hopefully that was useful. Um, I realized there was, it was kind of a whirlwind tour, a uh, lot of things fairly quickly. Um, but hopefully that gave you a, at least a decent introduction into um, how, to, how to manage and analyze text data. Um, and hopefully um, you've found this useful and maybe uh, you can uh, take advantage of some of the features that Meta provides. Um, for doing um, your text analysis tasks. Um, thank you very much for attending. Uh, I realize that there are lots of things that are vying for everyone's attention throughout the conference, so I really appreciate the fact that you were willing to spend three hours of your time listening to me ramble on about a thing that I made, um, but I really do appreciate it. Um, so hopefully um, this has been valuable for you and will lead to uh, success in the future. And I would love to, for Great things, forward. Yeah, there's so there's there's a um, so all the code is like I said it's all it's all open source both the Python bindings and the C, the or the actual C++ library that it is binding, um, both of them are open source, um, liberally licensed. Feel free to use it at a company; it's perfectly fine. Um, uh, so if you if you have a model that you think we should have that we don't have, um, I'm absolutely uh, encouraging you to consider contributing it to Meta. Even even just making an issue with a feature request to make me aware of things that you need to have is great because now I can you know either do that myself or throw students at it ideally in the future. Um, there's a and there's a there's a so if you go to our website, there's also uh, a developer forum. So um, 
if you have any any further remaining questions or would like to discuss something about you know implementing a particular thing or solving a particular task, um, go ahead and hit up the forum. Um, both Sean and I monitor it actively, so um, if we if if we can answer your question, we will certainly do that. And there there are a number of other people on there from like the the Coursera MOOCs that can also help answer things. So um, I think that's okay, it. Thank well, you. Thank you. <laughs>